Hello everyone this is part 12 of what if Naruto was betrayed and leaves Kanoa, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Ino get out of there. Ino's head snapped up when she heard Naruto shout. It was then she noticed she had run directly into the middle of both Naruto and Sasuke's oncoming attacks. Hesitating she froze with fear, as she realized the attacks were about to hit her and dropping to her knees while throwing her arms over her head she screamed out in terror. Naruto-kun. A scant second later another shout was heard which cried out. Enkozen, arc shield, deflect. Ino heard an explosion and realizing she hadn't been hit tentatively opened her eyes to peer out from under her arms. She was both relieved and surprised to see none other than Kakashi Hitaki standing over her with a shield of condensed Ryatsu formed on each of his arms. Looking around she saw both Naruto and Sasuke lying on the ground a great distance from where they had been at previously. The blonde Kanoiki didn't know how Kakashi had done it, but apparently he had deflected both attacks back to their sources. Namely Naruto and Sasuke. Well, this brings back some unpleasant memories. Kakashi stated panting from the exertion of fending off the attacks. Thank you for saving me Kakashi-sama. You're welcome Ino, but I have to say I'm more than a little displeased to see a trained Anbu operative go running out onto a battlefield like that. Before Ino could respond Naruto had flash stepped in front of her and gripped her shoulders from the sides. Looking down at her, he visibly trembled with rage and shouted at her. Ino-chan, what the hell do you think you were doing? I. I didn't want you to get hurt Naruto-kun. So what you thought running in between two deadly attacks was the right thing to do to prevent that? I. I. Idiot. I don't even want to look at you right now. All of you just leave me the hell alone. Naruto yelled out in a rage, before releasing Ino and Flash stepping once more, disappearing from the clearing. Ino could only gaze at the ground and weep to herself before a voice she recognized cry out to her. Ino-chan. Looking up the blonde Kanoiki could see an indigo-haired girl running towards her with lavender eyes, as Ino stammered out through her tears. Hi Hanata-chan. Upon reaching her weeping friend, Hanata was suddenly enveloped in a hug, as Ino began crying even more and kept saying over and over to the Huga girl. He hates me Hanata, Naruto-kun hates me. Shush. Naruto-kun doesn't hate you, he's just upset right now. I promise he could never hate you. Hanata replied while holding on to Ino trying to reassure the girl. No you're wrong, you didn't hear him, he hates me I just know it. I don't want to live anymore if Naruto-kun hates me. Ino cried out in hysterics. Hanata could tell that the Yamanaka girl was on the verge of a breakdown, as she released her embrace of the panicked girl and activated her Byakugan before striking out and closing off some Tenkatsu points on Ino's neck knocking the girl unconscious. As Ino slumped into Hanata's arms, another voice called out. Hanata. Kuranai Sensei. Laying Ino gently on the grass, Hanata leapt up and hugged her former sensei and surrogate older sister in a tight embrace, as both women had tears in their eyes. While both Kanoikis were hugging and crying tears of joy at their reunion. Sasuke had risen and walked over to where Kakashi stood by Ino and said. It's good to see you Kakashi Sensei. You don't have to call me Sensei anymore Sasuke. I haven't been your teacher for several years now. Force of habit Kakashi sense, senpai. An interesting blade you have there. Kakashi commented quietly, as he watched his former student sheathe his zanpakutu. Sasuke forced himself to hold his tongue, lest his pride get the best of him. Yes it is Kakashi senpai, it's called a zanpakutu and it uses kiddo based attacks and defense. Kakashi finished for his former pupil before adding. Yes. I'm well aware of what that blade is and what it does Sasuke. How is it you know about Kido? In fact, that was a Kido spell you used to redirect mine and Naruto's attacks back onto us. A weary look ran through Kakashi's visible eye. It's a long story Sasuke, I'll tell you about it later. First let's see if we can pry Kuranai and Hanata away from one another and all of us can sit down and catch up. Kakashi answered while kneeling down to scoop up Ino into his arms. The two Kanoikis who had been hugging leveled a hard glare at Kakashi before they broke apart and Hanata stated. All of you can come with me back to the camp. Before you arrived, Naruto-kun and I were about to sit down and have lunch. 
If you're hungry, I can have something prepared for all of you as well. We can also let Eno get some rest while we talk. Thank you Hanata, that sounds lovely. Kuranai commented. And all of us do have a lot to talk about, including Naruto. Kakashi declared in a grim tone. Upon hearing that, everyone else solemnly nodded their head in understanding, as they all began their trek back towards the Crimson Bandits encampment. After Hanata had gotten Eno situated inside her and Naruto's tent to rest, she joined all of her former comrades from the Leaf Village. As they all sat around a small fire after having lunch, it was Kuranai who finally broke the silence and asked. So Hanata, are you well? Has Naruto been treating you all right? I'm fine, Naruto-kun has treated me very well. Hanata commented, while slightly blushing remembering some of her nightly activities with the blonde Jinchuriki. Suddenly, some explosions were heard off in the distance, followed by a faint tremor beneath their feet, which threatened to dislodge some embers from the fire. Kakashi and Sasuke jumped to their feet in response before Hanata commented. There's nothing to be worried about, that's just Naruto-kun letting off some steam. I'm afraid your arrival has upset him a bit. He's probably sparring with Yugito-chan right now. Kakashi arched an eyebrow, but it was his fellow Junin who asked the question. Who is Yugito, Hanata? Yugito-chan is a friend of Naruto-kun and Ikurunai-sensei. How can she spar with Naruto and survive, when he's gotten so incredibly powerful? I wouldn't worry about Yugito-chan, she's a Jinchuriki same as Naruto-kun and is quite strong in her own right. A Jinchuriki. Kakashi swore beneath his breath at the news and then asked. Wait, what demon does she contain and where on earth did you find her? Yugito-chan holds the nibi, two-tailed cat, and I didn't find her anywhere Kakashi-sama. Naruto-kun rescued her from being captured by Sugetsu and Deodara of the Akatsuki. So, when I was able to locate Naruto-kun, she was already with him. Those are two of the most powerful members of that organization, how was Naruto able to rescue her? Hanata quietly shook her head. I don't know the details Kakashi-sama, all I know is Naruto-kun killed Sugetsu and injured Deodara who ran off before Naruto-kun could kill him. Naruto killed an Akatsuki member, H. Hao. Kuranai stammered in amazement, as she remembered all the Akatsuki were rated as S-class missing nins. In fact it was the Akatsuki member hidden who had killed Asuma and was said to be immortal. Fortunately Shikamaru had found a way around that immortality and took care of hidden forever avenging his sensei. Naruto-kun is very powerful and getting stronger every day. Hanata commented, while beaming with pride about Naruto. Kakashi took all this in silently, before finally declaring in a strenuous tone of voice. Well, if nothing else, this proves that the remaining Akatsuki are still after all the Jinchuriki. Naruto and this Yugito should return to Kanoa as soon as possible, you as well Hanata. A scowl spread across Hanata's face and her visage took on a determined look, as she said with defiance while activating her Byakugan. Naruto-kun doesn't want to return to the Leaf Village Kakashi-sama and I will only go back if Naruto wants to. If you try and take us back against our will, we will fight you. You'll lose Hyuga, Sasuke arrogantly announced. A spike of killer intent filled those pale orbs. Just try it Uchiha team. Alright, everyone calm down. No one is forcing anybody to go back to the Leaf Village at the moment. Kakashi announced while putting a hand on Sasuke's shoulder to keep the young man settled after Hanata's reply. Frustrated, Sasuke lashed out at his former teacher and said. I don't think you understand, if Naruto won't return to the village, Hokage Sunid has given me orders to capture or kill him as a last resort. Those orders have been rescinded Sasuke. Wa, what, are you sure Kakashi Senpai? Yes Sasuke, Kuranai and I received a message via a messenger falcon a day ago. Lady Sunid has cancelled the kill order and made our mission to bring Naruto back to the village, alive. Apparently, she has something planned for Naruto, but she didn't say what it is. Sasuke breathed a sigh of relief, but made no effort to hide the conceit in his voice. Well, I hope whatever the Hokage has planned will work in bringing the Dobe back, because I really don't want to have to kick his ass just to bring him back to the village. As if, Hanata snapped in an indignant tone before rising to go check on Ino. Sunid was doing her level best not to burst out laughing at the civilian council members' faces, as she left the council chamber after delivering her bombshell of news to the esteemed Kanoa council. Flashback. Thank you all for coming to this special session of the Kanoa council I requested. 
I know many of you are still in deep shock and mourning over the untimely and tragic death of Councilman Danzo. Soon it stated while shooting a quick glance to her advisors who wilted under her gaze before the blonde hockage continued on. However, we as a village must move on. To which by the power granted to me as hockage, I named Tuki Ichiraku to temporarily fill Councilman Danzo's seat until the regular elections for the civilian council comes up in a few months. As Tuki entered the council chamber and took his seat on the civilian side of the council once occupied by Danzo, one of his former lackeys on the council stood up and declared, You can't do that Sunid, that man is a known sympathizer to the demon Uzumaki boy. Silence you ignorant fool. First off, you will address me as Hokage Sama. Secondly, I have the power to name whoever I wish to the council in case of an untimely death to one of members. And lastly, you have broken the third's decree about speaking on that subject. Anbu, take this man to Rabiki for some reeducation immediately. A contingent of two Anbu appeared in a swirl of leaves before grabbing the shocked councilman and disappearing with the man. Leaving behind one very stunned and now very subdued civilian council in its wake. Now, if there are no more interruptions, I can get onto the matter of why I have called for this meeting today. Sunid declared while staring intently at the civilian council waiting for any of those fools to open up their mouth and say something. Satisfied that no one else on the civilian council was ready to risk incurring her wrath by saying something the blonde hockage then announced. As many of you have been pestering me for months to name a successor for the Rokadime position of hockage after I retire, I've reached a decision on who that will be. So you've finally decided to name Sasuke Uchiha as your successor Hokage Sama, that's wonderful news. Another one of Danzo's former lackeys of the civilian council piped up with glee. Shut up you idiot. I'd sooner name a fat fool like you to that position before I would name someone who once betrayed the village to the status of Rokadime Hokage. No, the individual I shall name for that position is the sole heir of the Yondime Hokage. What? That's preposterous. The Yondime had no living heirs. Shouts Homura before an icy glare from Sunid shut up the ancient advisor. Many council members then begin to voice their protests, but are subdued by Sunid's killing intent, before she says. Today's meeting has to do with the reading of the Yondimes will and officially recognizing this young man as the heir to the Namikas clan. Most of you already know this young man, his name is Naruto Uzumaki Namikas, the living Jinchuriki who keeps at bay the Kyubi no Yuko and is the only child and son of Minato Namikas, the Yondime Hokage. Absurd, everyone knows the Yondime used some random orphan to seal away the great demon years ago. One civilian councilman shouted before he was overwhelmed by Sunid's killing intent, as she said with venom. You stupid moron. Do you honestly think that the Yondime would use an orphan child to seal the beast away or even a child from a family? All of you sit there and shut up while I read the last document the fourth ever wrote which happens to contain his last will and testament. If you are currently reading this, either Yondime Hokage Minato Namikas write this knowing that I shall soon be dead. At this moment many of our brave shinobi have given or are currently giving their lives to fight a horrible terror that has befallen the village. A few hours ago the village hidden in the leaves was attacked by a biju known as the Kyubi no Yuko. It is the most powerful of all the great demons and though we have tried valiantly, we are simply incapable of defeating it. I am now left with only one recourse to save the village and its people. I'm going to have to seal away the demonic beast using a forbidden jutsu which will cost me my life. Moments ago, I just witnessed my wife of one year sacrifice her life to protect our newly born son, Naruto Uzumaki Namikas. The pain and grief from her death is shattering to me, especially with what I now have to do with our only child. I am sorry my son for I'm going to have to seal the Kyubi no Yuko into you, so it can't escape. It pains me greatly to place such a heavy burden onto you, but I cannot ask another family to give up the child for the act, if I wasn't willing to give up my own. I just hope the people of this village treat you Naruto with the respect you deserve. You should be viewed upon by all as a living hero, for you are the vessel that keeps the great beast from escaping and wreaking his vengeance upon the village once more. To my beloved son, Naruto, I leave to you every possession I have and I also leave to you your mother's will which you will find at the clan compound. Your mother's name was Uzumaki Kushina, the daughter of the Daimyo of the land of the Whirlpool. She was a beautiful woman, and she loved you very much. There is so much more I want to say to you, but time grows short. My son I have copies of every jutsu I've ever created with instructions on how to learn and use the hidden at the compound. 
Also, if you ever meet my sensei Jirai the Toad Sage and one of the legendary Sanan, he is your godfather. I leave it to him to teach you my two most prized jutsus that I ever created, the Raisingan and the Horatian no jutsu. Naruto, grow to be the splendid shinobi I know you will be. I entrust your care to Hiruz and Sarutobi to ensure that happens. I love you my son. Namika's Minato, the Yondime Hokage. After Sun had finished reading the document, a pall of silence fell over the council chamber like a shroud. After a moment, Hyashi Huga asked to examine the document with his Byakugan to attest to its validity. Upon scanning the document for any sign that it was a forgery, he deactivated his famous Keke Genkai and announced for everyone to hear. This document is genuine, it was written by the Yondime Hokage, Minato Namikas. Hmm, his father truly is the Yondime. Shikaku Nara commented in afterthought. Hi, Sunad replied. So, Hokage Sarutobi lied to everyone, I can't believe he would do such a thing. Anoiki Yamanaka shouted out in anger and frustration. Hi, he did Yamanaka-san, but Sarutobi sensei did that thinking he was protecting the boy. That's why Naruto was given his mother's maiden name and not his father's. Sunad stated with remorse to the angered clan leader. I guess that means that Naruto is the rightful heir to the Namika's clan. Chuza Akamaiki declares with certainty. Hi, he is, which is why I now call for a vote for this council and the village to recognize Naruto Uzumaki Namikas, as the rightful heir of the Namika's clan and my chosen successor to be the Rokudime Hokage. All of you, who approve of this measure, raise your hand. All members of both the civilian council and the shinobi council raised their hands in support. However, both Homura and Koharu were a little hesitant before a sharp glare from Sunad informed them of what their vote should be if they wanted to continue to live. Then by the power as the Godaim Hokage and of the Kanoa Council it shall be announced and is official that Naruto Uzumaki has been granted his rightful heritage and title of Naruto Uzumaki Namikas, the heir to the prestigious Namikas clan and our next Hokage. Applause breaks out among many of the council members, with the exception of one, who was engrossed with his own thoughts about the news he had just learned. I can't believe this has happened. I'm such a fool, I could have had the sole heir of the Namikas clan and the Leaf Village's next Hokage tied to my clan through marriage to my daughter Hanata. Now, I have nothing. Hyashi silently lamented to himself. End of flashback. The next day when the news of Naruto's true heritage as the living legacy of the Yondime Hokage Minato Namikas had been announced, it had thrown the village into an uproar. While a few die-hard Naruto haters refused to believe the news and said it was a trick. They were quickly silenced when the proof of the fourth Hokage's last will and testament had been authenticated by the Kanoa Council. And when Sunid read the will to the people of the Leaf Village it left a profound effect upon the villagers. The majority of the villagers were now dealing with a wide range of emotions within themselves when the truth about Naruto was revealed. The most prevalent emotions being happiness and joy upon learning that the last living legacy of the beloved fourth Hokage lived. And the emotions of guilt and remorse at how they had treated the boy growing up. It had been a few days since the announcement, as soon as stood on her balcony gazing over the village with disgust. It galled the blonde Hokage to no end at looking upon the very same people in the village, who used to shun or treat Naruto Pulley in the past, were now going out of their way to heap praise and kindness about him merely for the fact of who his father was. Even worse than the behavior these pathetic hypocrites of villages were the masses of people at the Hokage Memorial praying and begging for forgiveness to Minato for the sins they committed against his son in the past. And finally the most pathetic of the villagers were the ones who couldn't live with the guilt of what they had done in the past to Naruto and took the easy way out by committing suicide. When the villagers learned that Naruto was no longer there, it had created a general atmosphere of shame, guilt, and sorrow rampant throughout the village. As soon it continued to stare across the village and its people she thought to herself. Damn it, I, know everyone need Naruto to return home. Because if he doesn't, I'm not sure the Leaf Village can survive, as I fear the people are just going to wallow in their misery and guilt forever without him. After watching Hanata march off to go and check on Ino, Kakashi sat in muted silence as he pondered his next move in getting Naruto to return to the Leaf Village. Suddenly an idea emerged that he thought might have a chance in helping to facilitate Naruto's homecoming. Turning to Sasuke, he ordered the Uchiha male to follow him, while the two of them went off in search of Naruto. What? Naruto snapped at both his former sensei and comrade with an incredulous glare, pausing only to wipe a bead of sweat from his brow. 
After deciding that his ferocious rage had ebbed somewhat from their spa, he'd let Yugito go back to camp and was about to follow his fellow Jinchuriki, when Kakashi and Sasuke showed up. Now, as he carefully wrapped Zangatsu back in its cloth sheath, he contemplated what his former sensei had just said and was curious about the silver-haired Junin's sudden offer. That's right, the second and final stage of Bankai you've been working so hard to reach, I can help you and Sasuke achieve it much faster. Kakashi's smile could both be seen beneath his mask and in his cheerful demeanor. What's the catch? Naruto snarled in skepticism. Catch. Kakashi tilted his head to the side comically before asking. Now why would there be a catch? Is it really so wrong of me to lend my students a hand in their training? Yes, it is. Naruto countered, sparing Sasuke a heated glare before continuing on. Because the most you ever taught me was how to walk up trees. And if I recall, you were never too eager to teach me anything of significance only to the team over there including your prized jutsu the Chidori. Kakashi's head lowered a bit in guilt, the sting of Naruto's words hitting their mark, as he couldn't deny what he said was the truth, while his former student's glare spoke volumes. That was in the past and I deeply regret some of the choices I made back then. I can only ask that you trust me now when I say I wish to atone for my past actions and I honestly want to help you Naruto. Kakashi replied, in a penitent tone of voice. Words are cheap, actions speak louder and you still haven't said what the catch is. I wouldn't call it a catch per se, just a, condition. Naruto's scowl deepened. What kind of condition? Hanata quietly entered the tent she shared with Naruto so as not to awaken Ino, but to her surprise, the blonde Kanoiki was already awakened looking around the tent. Ino, are you feeling better? She started in surprise, but seemed to relax a bit once she'd recognized Hanata. Hi, I am Hanata, other than a sore throat I'm feeling much better. I'm sorry about doing that to you, but you looked like you were about to have a nervous breakdown. Yeah, maybe I was, I guess it was just the pain in knowing that the man I love hates me. Hanata paused, as she recalled the look of indescribable fury that Naruto had leveled at Ino only a few hours ago before trying to reassure he blonde friend. Naruto-kun doesn't hate you, he's just having a difficult time dealing with his feelings. I don't know, he seemed pretty certain when he said he couldn't even look at me anymore. I suppose he's forgotten all about me and has moved on to this Yugito girl I overheard you talking about outside. Um, well Naruto-kun does have feelings for Yugito-chan, and she for him, but they haven't acted upon them. Really, I figured this was Naruto's tent when I saw some of his stuff lying around. Then I noticed some female clothing in here and assumed Naruto was sharing this tent with this Yugito. Uh, well Naruto is sharing the tent with someone, but it's not Yugito. He, he's sharing the tent with, me. Hanata stated sheepishly, as her eyes darted to the ground. Oh I see, I guess I really am the idiot Naruto-kun called me. Congratulations Hanata, it looks like you've won. Ino stated the hurt evident in her tone as she spoke before turning her head away to keep from crying in front of Hanata. Ino, I want to talk to you, about me and Naruto-kun to try and explain. Hanata replied nervously, as she sat down on the ground across from Ino. What about him? Ino spat bitterly before continuing. There's nothing to explain, I should have guessed Naruto would be with you Hanata, you were always his first true love. I was nothing more to Naruto than the rebound girl after you married the mutt. A resounding smack echoed through the air. Stunned, Ino could only hold a hand to her face as a red hand print throbbed angrily upon her left cheek, her ears cringing as a very, very angry Hanata yelled at her. Look Ino I know you're hurting right now, but that gives you no right to speak such lies about Naruto-kun. You know very well that he loved you deeply and you were never the rebound girl to him as you put it after I got married. So stop being a spoiled jealous bitch and talk to me. Ino gazed towards her friend, shocked that Hanata had actually lost her temper like that and called her a spoiled jealous bitch. The Yamanaka girl was still rubbing her cheek when she heard the Hyuga girl stammer. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't mean to call you that, it's just I know how much you meant to Naruto-kun during the time you two were together. And though it hurt me deeply seeing you with Naruto-kun, I was happy for the both of you that you had found one another. I'm sorry for striking you, but I just got angry at hearing you denigrate the time you shared with him. It's okay, I guess I deserved that. This is just hard for me, knowing I've given up everything to try and find and be with Naruto only to learn that I'm too late, he's yours once again. I understand what you're feeling. 
I remember feeling jealous every time I saw you two together, even though I had no right to. I was married to Kiba which was my own fault due to my weakness, but even though you're my friend, I was still jealous because it was you with Naruto-kun and not me. Ino just sat there stunned and stared at Hanata. It never occurred to her that the Hyuga girl could sympathize with what she was feeling. Ino realized it must have been torture for Hanata seeing her true love with someone else. Ino was about to respond when the Hyuga girl spoke once more. But I won't apologize for being with Naruto now. I too have given up everything to be with him. My home, my family, my clan, everything. I have nothing left for me back in the Leaf Village other than hate and scorn from everyone, but I don't care. Naruto has taken me back into his life and I would rather die than to be apart from him ever again. I hope you can understand that. I understand, I'm sorry if I made you feel guilty in being with him. Do you still love him like before? I never stopped loving him. Hanata answered with no hesitation and absolute certainty in her voice. I see I'm happy for you Hanata. Ino stated while looking back down towards the ground. Do you still love him Ino? Hanata nervously asked, a little scared of what the answer would be. Ino could only laugh to herself, as she wrapped her arms around her to keep from collapsing in tears. Yes, I still love him. I love him more than I have anyone else in my entire life. Hanata could only gaze down, as she had no words to say to help ease the pain her friend was feeling. Before the Hyuga heiress could think of anything to say, she heard Ino declare with remorse. But it doesn't matter that I still love him, he hates me. I have nothing left anymore, Naruto-kun was one of only two people I had in my life that I truly cared about more than myself. And now knowing that he's gone from me forever, I'm just alone and the worst part about it is I can never replace him. Because no matter how long or hard I try, nothing can change the fact that I stupidly threw away best guy in the world. Ino shouted to herself in frustration. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yell out like that. You must think I'm pretty pathetic right now. Ino stated with embarrassment, bashfully avoiding eye contact with Hanata. No, I don't think you're pathetic. You could never be pathetic in my eyes. Hanata replied with sincerity, as she pulled the Yamanaka girl into a hug. Th, thank you Hanata, that means the world to me. Ino stated as a tear rolled down her cheek while hugging her friend a little bit tighter when she heard the Hyuga girl ask. Ino, can I ask you something? You mentioned someone else that you care about as deeply as Naruto-kun, can't you find happiness with that person? Ino's face went beet red and she pulled away from Hanata's embrace and turning her head away said with a tinge of sadness. I wish I could, but that other person has recently found someone else. Not that it matters, I wouldn't dare think of revealing my feelings to this other person for fear of ruining our friendship. But, even if this other person is in a relationship, you should still tell them your feelings and let them decide. I, I don't know, I'm scared of what they might think or do if I reveal my feelings. You said this person is a friend of yours, so if they are I'm sure everything will be alright. After taking a few moments to contemplate what Hanata had said, Ino mustered up her courage and said. Well, like I said, there is someone else that I care for as deeply as I do Naruto-kun, and that person is, dot you Hanata-chan. Time seemed to stand still for Ino as she stared anxiously into Hanata's eyes waiting for her response. For her part, Hanata just sat there wide-eyed and with a blank expression on her face before she stammered out in bewilderment. Wah, what did you say? Ino smiled a bit at Hanata's confusion before leaning in and placing a soft kiss on her lips. Hanata didn't move, as she was sure she was going to die from shock right then and there. In fact when she felt Ino's moist lips press against her own, without thinking, she opened her mouth in disbelief, which Ino took advantage of by sliding her tongue into the Hyuga girl's mouth. Hanata's eyes widened in shock, as she felt Ino's tongue snake its way in her mouth and playfully tease her own. Hanata then felt Ino's hands on her hips and by then she had already pressed herself against Hanata gently lowering the practically frozen Hyuga girl to the ground. Hanata wanted to stop her, wanted to break away, but the pleasure she was feeling from the kiss and from Ino's hands caressing her body was proving a difficult adversary to fight against, and she could feel herself losing the battle. Ino now had Hanata pinned under her making escape virtually impossible for the girl. Hanata moaned lustfully into Ino's mouth, as she felt the Yamanaka heiress squeeze her ass, while her other hand swept itself up Hanata's shirt to fondle the soft skin of her breasts.
Panata finally regained enough control and strength to move, as she turned her head around sharply to the side to break the kiss and cried out while panting in desire. S stop it Eno, I can't do this. I love Naruto-kun and I would never cheat on him, I couldn't do that to him, I'd rather die first. Panata said while hurriedly extricating herself from underneath the blonde Kanoiki. Tears started falling from Eno's eyes, as she buried her face in the palms of her hands and stammered out in sorrow. I'm, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to take it that far. I was only intending on giving you an innocent kiss. I don't know what came over me. Please please don't hate me Hanata, I don't think I could stand it if you did. I it's okay, Hanata replied, still quite flustered herself, as she tried to soothe the distraught Yamanaka heiress. I don't hate you, I was just taken by surprise, but I just don't know what to say now. I'm so confused, I thought you loved Naruto-kun. I I do love him Hanata, but over the years as we grew closer as friends, I also started developing feelings for you while still being madly in love with Naruto-kun. Ino replied in quiet earnest before continuing on to try and provide a better explanation. Hanata, I know it's hard to understand and I really don't know how to explain it either. Ino fidgeted a bit, trying not to blush and upon failing to do so, reluctantly continued. I would be lying if I said I wasn't attracted to you, but I still love Naruto-kun and I think I love you too. Because you and Naruto-kun are the only two people whose feelings I care about more than my own. I know it's hard to believe, but you and Naruto-kun are the two most important people in my life. Ah, are you saying you're bisexual? No, at least not in the way you think. Because as I know Naruto-kun is the only man I can ever truly love, I also know you're the only woman I can truly love as well. I've never had these feelings for any other man or woman, because I know I would never find anyone else as beautiful, kind, and as loving as the two of you. Ino replied with sincerity before a soft sob escaped her lips, as she sat on the ground and pulled her legs up to her chest, arms wrapped around them with her chin resting on her knees and in a pain-filled voice asked. I've ruined our friendship haven't I? Hanata had been listening intently to everything Ino had been saying and now gazing at her sullen friend, she made a decision that seemed totally outrageous and impulsive, but it also seemed to make total sense, as she stated while stuttering. No, you haven't ruined anything, I'm glad you told me. I, I care a great deal about you too and I know you love Naruto-kun deeply. Yes sir I wouldn't mind shush sharing him with you. Do, do you really mean that Hanata? Ino exclaimed in astonishment when she heard the Hugo girl's suggestion. Yes, I want us to remain friends and I don't want you to see you hurt. You're my best friend, I couldn't have survived these last three years without you there to support me. And I couldn't stand to see you in pain because I'm with Naruto-kun. Plus, I feel really guilty for feeling this way and saying this, but I enjoyed our kiss. Hanata stated sheepishly while looking away from her blonde best friend. Ino moved over and sat next to Hanata and put an arm around her shoulder in comfort. Hanata turned to face Ino once again who said with assurance. Don't feel guilty, if you know that you love Naruto-kun more than anything else in the entire world then you shouldn't feel ashamed. Thank you Hanata for making such an offer, but it doesn't matter, Naruto wants nothing to do with me, so the three of us being together in such a way is just a fantasy. I told you before Ino, Naruto-kun doesn't hate you. In fact just the opposite I think he still loves you because the only times I've ever seen him get that upset, it's usually with someone he cares for very deeply. Let me talk to him, but I'll need some time okay. Ino nodded her head in understanding, before both women rose to their feet. As they made their way to the entrance of the tent, Hanata turned around and with a mischievous spark in her eye stated. You know, Naruto-kun is many things, but he's also still a man. So I think he would find it totally hot if he knew I wanted to be with you and him at the same time. Ino grew wide-eyed in surprise upon hearing Hanata's declaration and even more shocked when the Hugo girl leaned in to place a passionate kiss upon her lips. After a moment the initial shock wore off and Ino fervently returned said kiss with eager enthusiasm before both girls finally broke away from one another and exited the tent giggling. Dar a a a m n it I'm bored. When the hell are they gonna get here? A man snorted in complaint, the sound filling the otherwise silent room, bouncing off the walls, echoing loudly. After a moment, another voice rang out in deadly authority and with annoyance. Unless you want to end up like Sugatsu only by my hand, I suggest you be quiet. Hey, the Nine Tails didn't beat me that bad Madara-sama. 
Deodoro submissively pled in his defense, before adding, We just got caught off guard, that's all. The clay using Akatsuki member still wasn't too pleased by the direction the battle had taken and he wanted to be well prepared before he ran into the Jinchuriki again. And because of that, Sugitsu is dead. There was a foreboding silence and they all knew why. For Sugitsu to have been killed so easily, so effortlessly, it was more than a little concerning to the elder Uchiha. Naruto had slaughtered Sugitsu, as if he were just a mere genin, not an S-class missing nin. That meant Naruto had grown even stronger, since the fourth shinobi war. Madara was brought out of his musings, when Zetsu rose from the floor and announced. They're here Lord Madara. I still think this is a bad idea Madara-sama, he can't be trusted. Deodara openly commented. Fortunately, you're not paid to think. Zetsu grumbled in irritation, his face hidden as always within the giant fly trap type collar. This frigid weather was not to his liking. Why couldn't they have lured the Jinchuriki to some humid jungle? Why did it have to be a stupid little village that was always covered in snow? He hated the snow. I'd shut up half in half, before I introduce you to my art. Deodara spat back in anger. Silence the both of you. He may not be trustworthy, but I need his skills and power to help take down the Nine Tails. We lost too many of our fellow brethren in last war and now with Sugatsu's death, we need to shore up the ranks of the Akatsuki, if we are to accomplish my goals. Madara declared, before signaling Zetsu to bring the guests to him. A minute later, an extremely pale-skinned human with waist-length black hair and amber eyes with slits in his pupils and purple markings around his eyes entered the room. He also bore two plain blue tomo-shaped earrings. The man wore a plain grey long flowing shirt over a black long-sleeved shirt with black pants and a thick purple rope belt tied in a large knot behind his back. Another man was trailing behind the first one. This man had onyx eyes and ash-grey hair, which was kept in a ponytail that extended to his upper back, with his bangs framing either side of his forehead. He also wore a dark purple shirt with a high collar, a white undershirt and fingerless gloves with armored plates on the back of the hand, a white cloth waistband worn at an angle, dark purple pants, blue sandals, and a shuriken holster on his right leg. When they pair reached the throne upon where Madara was sitting they bowed in respect, before Madara spoke up and said. Orokimaru, Kabuto, thank you for accepting my invitation. Ku, ku, ku. Given our past history together, I wasn't sure that we should, but you did promise a safe passage both to here and upon leaving if we so choose. So I accepted, as I know you Uchiha hold honor in very high esteem. Now what is it that you wish to speak to me about Madara Uchiha? I wish for you and your protege to join the ranks of the Akitsuki once more. For what purpose? As you already know, the events that led up to and during the fourth shinobi war has left only Deodara, Zetsu, and myself as surviving members. What about Sugatsu? My sources informed me long ago that he had joined your ranks. Regrettably, Sugatsu was lost to us at the hands of the nine-tailed Jinchuriki. I see, so Naruto is still a thorn in your side. It's a thorn I shall soon be removing, but to do so I need to bolster the ranks of my Akatsuki to help me accomplish that, hence why I have called upon you. Orokimaru rubbed his chin in contemplation for a moment, before he asked in curiosity. Ku, 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 if I were to rejoin your organization, what's in it for me? Konohagakur, our former homeland, Orokimaru exclaimed in surprise. Yes, the village hidden in the leaves will be yours to rule as you see fit, once we've conquered it of course. An intriguing offer Madara, I thought you would like it. I imagine once in power, you and your protege can experiment on the citizens to your heart's content, as you are still seeking the prize of immortality. And all you need of us is to help you capture the Nine Tails. Correct. If I accept and we take down Naruto and then conquer Kanoa and I assume control over our village. What will you be doing? With the powers of the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox at my command, I will seek out all of those nations that opposed me during the Fourth Shinobi War and subjugate all of them under my heel for the rest of their miserable lives and beyond. Madara answered with malevolence. So it's revenge you seek and nothing more. Yes, with the moons I plan forever defeated. I want to crush everyone who had a part in the destruction of my lifelong dream. Orokimaru stood silent as he considered the elder Uchiha's offer. After a minute, he finally spoke up and said, I will accept your invitation and the prize that goes with it Madara, but I want one more thing if I do. What? I want Sasuke Uchiha. Done. I have no love for my kinsman, 
considering he too helped play a vital part in defeating me and ruining my moon's eye plan for the future. He's yours for the taking if you wish. Madara immediately agreed, with no doubt in his voice whatsoever. Coo, 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 I'm most pleased with this arrangement. Now do you have a plan to capture Naruto? I have set a plan in motion that the Kyubi no Yuko container will come to us soon enough, whether he will do so willingly or not. I too am pleased that you've accepted to rejoin our ranks Orokimaru, but remember if you betray us again it will not be Atachi who you will be facing as you did in the past, it will be, me. Orokimaru nodded his head in understanding, as he knew for as skilled and powerful as he was, it was nothing compared Madara's power and skill in battle. Are you fucking kidding me? Naruto spat with fury, surprised at how blatant Kakashi had been about asking. You want Hanata-chan and I to go back with you and Kurenai-sensei to Kanoa in exchange for Bankai training. Well then you can fucking forget it Hitaki. Kakashi noticed that Naruto still used the sensei attachment for Kurenai, but not for him. The once proud sensei of team number 7 winced at the venom his former student spat, before exhaling softly, knowing full well what his former student's reaction would be to what he was about to say next. I'm not asking you to decide right away. I'm only asking that you consider it. I have. Naruto performed an about face, his back now to Kakashi. And as I said before, you can go fuck yourself. Naruto, just do as Kakashi sensei asks. At once, Naruto whipped his head toward his former teammate. Screw you Sasuke. You were always his favorite pet on the team not me. You should do what he says, since you were the only one who he ever trained and gave a damn about. I'm not going back to Kanoa just because this hypocrite asks me to. I'll learn to achieve Bankai on my own. Naruto angrily declared, before stomping off to begin his training. With Kakashi's offer still on his mind, Naruto scowled in determination. All right, one more time. Irritated, but resolute to give it another go, Naruto swept his arm back out, palm resting upon his forearm, thrusting Zangatsu forward as the energy began to stream out of the sword, and into his body. Blue light flickered at his feet and then began to rise around him, forming, swirling, spiraling into nothing. Naruto's whiskered face creased in frustration, as the energy sputtered and died, leaving him on his knees gasping for air that came slowly and fitfully. Sweat beaded from his brow, forming a small puddle at his feet, a puddle which he now smashed his fist into with aggravation. Damn it. What the hell am I doing wrong? Naruto seethed internally as he looked to the right. A red Ryatsu whipped around the Uchiha's body, raw, yet controlled, powerful enough to shatter a nearby tree into timbers, but held in check just the same. Naruto allowed himself a small contented smile. Sasuke seemed to be having the same trouble when it came to controlling his energy in unison with that of his blade. No sooner had the thought occurred to him, than the dome contracted, the sphere of destruction now only extending about a yard outward. Sasuke smirked at the disbelieving expression his former teammate now wore. Surprised. No, not at all. Naruto grumbled, forcing himself back to his feet, before his own blue Riatsu came in answer to Sasuke's red, the twin colors conjoining together and creating purple, sparks beginning to fly between their blades. In another life, such an insult sent blood boiling. However, this was a different life, a different Naruto. His temper, still volatile as before, had now become tempered, focused upon a single goal, one sole objective and nothing else. Naruto's anger now forged, into an unstoppable blade, much like the one that lay before him. This drove him forward to his task. Naruto Uzumaki had a purpose. The revelation was as swift as it was stunning and everything dropped away, leaving the ex-shinobi in the blackness. All this time, what had he been fighting for? At first, it had been pure instinct, an almost unholy desire to escape, to rid himself of Kanoa and all those who inhabited it, all those who had caused him pain. Like the wind that was his element, Uzumaki Naruto had no course, he held no conceivable course or direction. Save for Tazuna and his family, that Naruto had lashed out at any and all who dared approach him, torn down all and anything that possessed the impudence, the gall to bar the wayward path that he had once believed to be freedom. He killed for survival, but he had ended lives all the same. And then Neliel entered his life. Considering it now, she would have charmed anyone else, no matter how black their heart into submission the moment they crossed her path. It was mere happenstance that she had encountered Naruto first, before one of the now dead bandits had noticed her. Uzumaki shuddered at the thought and what it implied. Nell belonged to him. 
there was no other way to explain the complex father-daughter relationship that had flourished so seamlessly between the two. She taken to him like a fish to water, he needed her to temper the darkness that still dwelled within him. Then Yugito entered the fold. Perhaps it was the fact that she too was a Jinchuriki, or that she too knew the pain of loss and abandonment, of being shunned, scorned, hated, just for her very existence. There was just, something about her. An irresistible pull surrounded her, something close to magnetism. He'd felt it the moment he'd slammed the Nibby vessel into the tree and demanded that she be quiet. The moment Nell had innocently suggested that Yugito could be a, wife Chan, and despite his initial dismay, Naruto felt a shared bond with Yugito that no one other than another Jinchuriki could understand. The fact that Yugito was one of the few people who could actually spar with him and come out alive, well, that was a plus too. Then there was, dot her. Naruto never imagined being reunited with his first true love and had resigned himself to the fact that she was gone forever. So it was quite a shock to Naruto when Hanata joined his growing little family, reclaiming a tender place in his heart that had never quite healed since they'd first parted ways. Now their love with one another was as strong and as passionate as it had been years ago. It was as if Hanata had never married Kiba and that it had all been just a bad dream to begin with. As Naruto thought about his indigo-haired princess he smiled at the way her eyes misted over with motherly warmth whenever she saw Nelial or the way her cheeks would flush a deep crimson scarlet whenever he whispered in her ear. The power she held over him with just a few soft words she could speak would calm him down in an instant or with her gentle soothing touch that spoke of a dedicated lover who knew him so well that words were not even necessary between them. Whenever Naruto thought of his Hyuga princess, he was filled with bliss. Last, but certainly not least there was Ino Yamanaka who had been suddenly thrust back into his life much to his chagrin. The blonde-haired Kanoiki evoked a fierce fiery sensation of raw pain and agony, stabbing into his heart, twisting and knotting around his very soul. Ino still provoked age-old feelings of deep love, but at the same time the pain was there threatening to strangle that love and turn it into rage. Naruto knew he had to be careful, very careful when it came to Ino. His breakup with her had actually been the most painful of them all. Not because he had loved Ino any more than he had loved Sakura or Hanata, but because he had warned the Yamanaka heiress that his heart had been rendered so vulnerable by those two. He was fearful that if he allowed himself to love Ino and something were to happen to them, he wouldn't be able to take that kind of pain a third time. And Naruto still remembers Ino's response to his fears word for word to this day when he asked at the start of their relationship. Do you mean it Eno-chan, do you really love me? I meant every word Naruto-kun, and I promise I'll never hurt you. Yes, Naruto was still torn when the matter fell to Muzyamanaka, and it aggravated him greatly that she still held some significance in his life, whether it was a painful one or not, that was for him to decide. However, it didn't change the facts that now raced through his mind about his upcoming battle against the Akatsuki. I'm not doing this for myself. He had to speak the words aloud in order to actually realize them. No, there's more to it than that. I'm not fighting because I want to win, I'm fighting because, because I have to win. This isn't all about me now, even though I want it to be. I'm dot not alone anymore. Nell, Hanata, Yugito, even Nino, everyone. Unlikely as it would seem, Naruto, had somehow rediscovered the meaning of love and friendship. These were important people in his life once again there were those that he wanted no, needed to protect. And if it meant making a suicide run against the world's most powerful criminal organization. Well, stubbornness was the one aspect of his personality that hadn't changed. If it kept them safe, then it was all worth it. With this in mind, everything became clear as day. Spurred on by this determination, Naruto inhaled and took up Zangatsu once more. Gripping the wrapped tang in both hands the Jinchuriki grunted, a determined scowl breaking through the half-smile, as white-hot fire roared into existence, spreading from the blade and into his body. Impressive. A familiar voice called out in his mind, as a figure faded in and out of Naruto's head, translucent in his appearance, yet firm in his voice. You're much like my old master, Naruto. Suddenly, for a moment, a figure appeared of a tall, lean-built, and stoic middle-aged man. He had pale skin, high cheekbones, stubble, and long ragged black hair with brown highlights. His attire consisted of a tattered white dress shirt with an upturned collar and cuffs, black pants, low-heeled boots, and a long, amorphous black overcoat with a burgundy highlight that flares out into ragged ends. 
He wore brown tinted, semi transparent wrap around sunglasses. And he smiled at Naruto, before he disappeared altogether. Sasuke, unaware of what just happened, could only blink, startled by the display. Dobe, what are you? Zangatsu. Naruto exclaimed, thrusting the Zanpaktu before his chest for the second time grinning wildly, as the bluish-black light all but howled into existence about his body, forming his own dome of destruction, a massive translucent black sphere that stretched three yards in comparison to Sasuke's one. As the Uchiha looked on in disbelief, the white cloth unwound from the tang and wrapped itself tight about the blonde's shoulder, which he thrust forward prominently, stabbing outward with the hulking blade, growling softly as the ground began to quake. Sasuke found himself taking a small step back, as Naruto began to laugh. No way, don't tell me. Sasuke realized. Naruto had achieved the final stage of Bankai. Another far-off tremor shook the ground and Kakashi winced, as he heard the unmistakable sound of laughter in the distance. Clearly Naruto was quite content with his current lifestyle and had absolutely no desire to return to Kanoa, which made his mission even more difficult than it was already. This left Kakashi with a serious dilemma, he couldn't just drag Naruto back to the village, such a thing was impossible. Well, he could try, but he'd likely end up losing an arm in the process. Hanata would doubtlessly fight, as would Yugito. Ino's position on this was still questionable, and Kurenai would likely side with her former pupil if it came down to a fight. Sasuke wouldn't hesitate to fight Naruto though, so at least the last Uchiha could be counted on to help Kakashi complete the mission. Then there was the matter of this little gang that Naruto had amassed. They were all extraordinarily loyal and if Naruto fought, then so would they. Then again, most of the men had left, headed for some unknown destination, the likes of which were being kept tightly under wraps. Was now the time to strike. Now, when Naruto had only two allies instead of hundreds, it would be a simple matter to slip a harmless sedative into their food and drink, but with Naruto's superior sense of smell and Hanata's Byakugan, would such a tactic even work? It was doubtful at best. And if he were to fail, for the first time in his elite career as a Junin, Kakashi felt out of control of a situation. Just the thought of fighting an angry Huga and a pair of raging Jinchuriki was unpleasant. Factor in a potentially furious Kurenai and Ino with their Genjutsu abilities and actually engaging in combat with the five of them was outright terrifying. Thankfully, an unfamiliar chakra signature was felt by the silver-haired Junin, which broke him out of his train of thought. Performing a quick set of hand seals, he silently slinked after the suspicious bandit being careful as not to be seen through the camouflage his jutsu provided him. Sakaki Hitoshi crept through into the very edge of the encampment, glanced around briefly and muttered to himself, before slipping into an unmarked tent. Kakashi stiffened a bit, as a small hiss escaped from the mask he always wore. That was Kurenai's tent. In an instant, Kakashi flew into the tent and was greeted with the sight of Sakaki pinning Kurenai down and attempting to force his way with her. A primal growl erupted from Kakashi and before he knew what he was doing, his hand was tightly gripped around the bandit's face and the Kanoa Junin was currently sending jolts of electricity through said hand. Sakaki was screaming in agony, as his face was in danger of being burnt to a crisp, before Kurenai leapt up and knocked Kakashi's arm away causing the one-eyed Junin to drop his foe abruptly. Staggering out of the tent, Sakaki covered his face, in a vain attempt to stem the red liquid coursing through his fingertips. The smouldering burns he had just suffered would soon become hideous and disfiguring scars if they were not tended to soon. Sakaki looked up to see several people running towards his location, no doubt alerted by his screams and quickly skulked away before being discovered. Hanata and Ino were the first to arrive and were startled to see Kakashi come flying out of Kurenai's tent and land in a heap on the ground. This was followed by a disheveled Kurenai storming out of her tent who shouted with rage and indignation. What the hell did you think you were doing Kakashi? It was then that Hanata noticed the top of Kurenai's bandages above her breasts had been torn open. Jumping to a conclusion that Kakashi had attacked Kurenai, the Huga princess shouted out with vengeful fury and attacked the silver-haired Junin with lightning-fast Jukan strikes. Byakugan, how dare you attack Kurenai-sensei? The intensity of Hanata's unexpected attack was so fierce, that even for a seasoned Junin like Kakashi, he was finding it difficult to block all of Hanata's fast-moving strikes. Kurenai gasped with surprise when she saw her former student suddenly attack Kakashi and hearing what she said. Looking down to see her bandages ripped around her breasts in disarray she suddenly realized what Hanata must have thought had happened. It was then that Hanata's defiant shriek snared her attention. 
The raging Hyuga had knocked Kakashi off balance and raised her arm to deliver a crushing blow. That is, until Kurenai appeared behind the Hyuga princess and pinned the girl's arm behind her back. Stop it Hanata you're mistaken, Kakashi didn't attack me, but fended off my attacker. Hanata turned her head, blinked and looked at her former teacher with confusion. But, but if Kakashi sensei did that, why were you yelling and attacking him when we arrived Kurenai sensei? I, I, Kurenai stammered, as she sought to answer the question, but found that she couldn't before looking towards Kakashi. The red-eyed Kanoiki saw a brief moment of hurt flash across his face, before he quickly initiated a series of hand signs and disappeared in a swirl of leaves. A moment later, Naruto and Sasuke arrived to find out what was going on. Sighing heavily, Kurenai began to inform everyone about what had happened. Ayami was tending to the evening meal when she first heard him. Ah, the lovely Ayami. As always, his voice sent a small shiver up her spine and this time it was all she could do not to scream at the top of her lungs for her husband, who was still away training with Captain Kenpachi and the others. How are you this fine evening? Sakaki placed a hand upon her shoulder, a bit too forcefully. To her credit, she managed to keep the fear from flashing through her eyes, though the second Haruko skipped into view and saw the look on her mother's face, her tiny body betrayed her and instantly began to tremble. Exhaling softly, Ayami willed the tension to leave her system, her mind to be calm, and forced a reassuring smile to bloom on her pale face. It wasn't anywhere near as effective as she'd hoped it to be. Haruko took small step back, her lower lip already beginning to quiver in fear. I am well, Ayami replied, while struggling to keep her tone nonchalant and willed her body to turn and face him. Her attempt to be cordial fell by the wayside. She was not prepared for the sight that greeted her, and as such, was unable to stifle the shriek that left her lips. At once she slapped his hand away and lurched back in disgust. For her gaze was focused on a face that had once been handsome and lovely. No longer. Several puss-filled ropey blisters almost in the shape of a hand now marred that once charming visage, turning what should have been a pleasant smile, into an ugly scowl. My dear, I mean you no harm. In fact my intentions are quite the opposite. If that's all you have to say, then do you mind? Eager to look at anything other than his hideous face, Ayami turned her back to Sakaki perhaps a little too quickly. I have to prepare dinner. Both hands clamped down upon her shoulders, and she found herself viciously spun about. In the confusion, she l. Oh no my dear, I have absolutely no intention of leaving. You see I have business here of my own. First, you are one of the top healers within the camp and I need you to heal my injuries. Hiding behind her mother, Haruko whimpered. Mommy, I'm scared, where's daddy? Inexplicably, the fear in Ayami's eyes called at that. She lowered her hands, no longer trying to defend herself against his advances, but at the same time, refusing to submit to the loathsome creature. Exhaling, the mother drew up to her full height of five foot four, and gazed up at Sakaki. And if I heal you, you will then leave. I'll leave, but only after I've repaid you for your services only I can. Sakaki answered with a sneer, before groping one of Ayami's breasts through her apron. Ayami immediately knocked his hand away and shouted with disgust. Get out my tent this instant. Momentarily taken aback, Sakaki reeled away from her, his gaze darting furiously about the room for any sign of an intruder, anything that might have strengthened her resolve. Finding nothing of the sort, he scoffed and turned his twisted scarred visage back to Ayami once more. And why should I? Sakaki didn't have time to finish his sentence. By the time he'd registered the thin rustling sound that was the tent flap opening behind him, he'd already been hauled outside and thrown mercilessly to the ground. When the Crimson Bandit's face hit the dirt he screamed out in agony, as a crunching sound was heard indicating a now broken nose. Even worse for Sakaki was the fact that his burns were still relatively fresh in the dirt, grass, and stones opened his blistered wounds. You bastard, look what you've done to my face. Sakaki screamed with rage and pain at the masked silver-haired Junin standing over him. The low, angry growl reverberated from the chest of one Kakashi and the ground began to tremble around him. Haruko poked her little head out of the tent with a giggle, only for a familiar pair of hands to quickly usher her back inside seconds later. And still, the earth continued to quiver, quaking as if it were caught in throes of a violent storm. Sakaki's eyes grew wide with fear when he suddenly heard the sound of a thousand birds chirping and remembered it was the same sound he had heard just before his face was burned to a crisp. 
as Kakashi stepped forward to meter out his own brand of judgment upon the Crimson Bandit on the ground before him a shout rang out stopping him. Enough Kakashi Sensei, it is not your job to discipline my men for their crimes, but mine. I know what happened and that scum before you I can assure will be punished. So I'm asking you to stand down and let me take care of this matter. Kakashi was literally shaking with rage and was poised to deliver a killing blow to Sakaki with his Chidori, as he listened to Naruto. After a moment, he exhaled a deep breath and deactivated his trademark jutsu before turning towards Naruto and saying in an icy tone of voice. All right Naruto, I will let you handle this matter. You say you know what happened, so I'm trusting in you that this pig will get the punishment he so richly deserves. Your trust will not be misplaced Kakashi Sensei. Rushing past his former teacher, the Jinchuriki glared balefully into the fear-stricken eyes of the once handsome bandit. Mark my words he will pay for what he has done. Naruto declared with a grin that would peel flesh from bone. Kakashi blinked. By the way Naruto, you've been referring to me as Kakashi Sensei. Grr, don't get used to it Kakashi Sen, Hataki. Naruto growled with irritation, before suddenly grasping Sakaki by his hair and began dragging the wailing man to the center of the encampment with Kakashi following close behind. Most of the people still residing in the camp had gathered forming a large circle in its center and looked on with confusion as Naruto arrived and threw Sakaki unceremoniously to the ground before standing over him with a murderous look to his eyes. Just as he was about to say something, Naruto paused and looked to the air around him. At this same time, all the other Kanoa shinobi rose and looked about in scrutiny. Suddenly, the air in the center of the circle shimmered for a moment, rippling much like the disturbed surface of the lake. For a moment there was silence, before a voice rang out seemingly from nowhere. Naruto-sama, we have returned. The air then split apart of its own accord and black nothingness stretched apart from it, revealing the host of that voice. Shunsui couldn't have had better timing as he stepped through the portal and presented himself before Naruto. Then, one by one a series of portals began emerging from the air around them, as all the people began backing up and creating an even larger circle. Next to arrive was Kenpachi Zaraki with a cheerful Yachiru sitting upon his left shoulder and Nell on his right. For some reason or another, both girls seemed particularly cheerful today, more so than usual. Nellil's smile shone like the setting sun when she laid eyes upon her surrogate father, as she leapt off of Kenpachi and cried out. Naru-kun. Naruto, was unprepared for this and nearly toppled backward from the glomid attack, but kissed his adopted daughter's cheek and hugged her fiercely. Happy reunions such as this were occurring everywhere, as the entire Crimson Bandit army returned from their training and was greeted by their loved ones. Sakaki saw that everyone's attention was no longer upon him and attempted to sneak away before a Zanpaktu was leveled at his throat and he gazed up into the onyx-colored eyes of a grinning Sasuke who was shaking his head at the man. As Naruto's gaze swept over the emerging army, the last notable figure stepped out of the blackness. Her hair was no longer held back in the topknot as before, rather, flowed freely down her back. Indeed, the ragged state of her outfit left little to the imagination of the men. Yoruichi. Naruto nodded curtly, bracing himself, half expecting the tan goddess to glide over to him and say something inappropriate. She did not. It was then that Naruto noticed that she did glide over and loop an arm in Shunsui's, before she kissed him on his cheek. Hmm. Despite himself, Naruto blinked, unable to hide his relief and amusement, before a stern voice called out. So, kid, ready for that rematch. I wanna find out if I'm stronger than you now. Kenpachi asked while grinning broadly. Despite himself, the ex-shinobi blanched. And not right now, we have other matters that need to be dealt with. Naruto answered a bit too hastily, as he pointed towards Sakaki lying prone on the ground with Sasuke's Zanpaktu still pressed to his throat. Zaraki's one visible eye narrowed upon gazing at that scene, as he took note of Sakaki's new facial appearance and of the young man wielding a Zanpaktu that he easily recognized from the past. He then noticed the crowd that had assembled to watch everything unfold. Turning his attention back to Naruto he asked with curiosity. All right, what the hell's going on here? What's with Sakaki's new look and who are all of these new people here? I can sense they're all pretty strong, especially my fellow one-eyed counterpart with the silver hair and the kid with Renji's Zanpaktu. As to who all of these new people are, I'll explain everything to you later Zaraki. Right now just consider them my guests and treat them accordingly. As to Sakaki's new appearance and how he came to obtain it, that shall be explained right now. Everyone stepped back, 
as the trial of Sakaki Hitoshi is about to commence. Naruto then ushered Nell to go sit with Hanata, as he had grown up stuff to do. The little Arankar nodded her head and kissed his cheek before racing over and jumping up into Hanata's arms with a joyful shout of, Hina-chan. Hanata then began to give introductions to all of the confused Kanoa contingent of people around her. Trial, what's going on? I sent Sakaki back over several hours ago to inform you that we would be returning so you could prepare a celebration for us. Kenpachi stated with confusion. Well, he didn't inform us and instead used his time to attack and attempt to rape two women within the camp including one of my guests. Naruto calmly replied. What? Kenpachi roared out with fury. K. Kenpachi-sama. Sakaki wailed aloud fearing for his life and prostrated himself before his former leader the instant he was released. Please, forgive me my lord Zaraki, please help me. Sakaki pleaded in terror. Those pleas ended outright when the tip of Zaraki's blade pricked his throat. Shut up you worm, you may be one of my lieutenants, but if I find out these charges are true, I'll kill you myself. Zaraki spat with righteous fury. I can assure you they're true Zaraki. Let's get this over with, Sakaki you are charged with assault and attempted rape of Yuhi Kurenai and Ayami Soto, how do you plead? Naruto asked with contempt. I'll kill you. Daisuke roared out with vengeance, as he strode forward through the crowd of bandits brandishing a massive double-bladed axe, the sight of which caused his fellows to swiftly give him a wide berth. Daisuke disregarded the cries of panic coming from Sakaki that his presence elicited from the disfigured man. Sakaki skittered backward while drawing a dagger in an attempt to put some distance between himself and the raging muscle man marching towards him. Daisuke cast his former comrade a murderous glare, while swinging the titanic weapon he held with one hand, its hulking handle gleaming in the fading evening light, a veritable blur of twirling in his palm as if it weighed no more than a feather. The expression he wore went far beyond mere anger. No, this was the most unholy of rages, feared by all, rival to none and it was reincarnated in the form of Daisuke. For there was no greater force in this world or the next than a man fighting for the sake of his family. The fact that Sakaki, his most hated rival had attempted to rape Ayami had sealed this man's death as far as he was concerned, as he stated with no remorse. Naruto-sama forgive me, but there is no need for a trial, as this dog will die here and now. Enough. Both men paused, wincing as a killer intent loomed over them, the cold steel marking their throats an instant later. Somehow, with his own life mere inches from being swept away, Daisuke found his voice. En Naruto-sama. I. I said, that is enough. Naruto ordered with authority, as his right hand clasped Daisuke massive axe, while his left remained curled into a tight fist about Sakaki's dagger his body positioned firmly between the two. As the new leader of the Crimson Bandits separated the two men from the folds of his sleeves, a pair of long, razor-thin blades extended and they were the cause for the discomfort of both men. One pricked at Sakaki's throat, while its partner was centimeters away from doing the same to Daisuke. Now, Naruto brought the full weight of his glare upon his trusted lieutenant and angrily stated. You, of all people, should know better than to start a battle here, I expected better of you Daisuke. But I, I, I said be silent, you are to kill no one unless I give the order got it. Shamefaced, the strongman clamped shut his jaw and hung his head before submissively answering. Understood. Dot sir. Daisuke then cast his former comrade a glare, but remained still, as per ordered, though his hands gripped the massive axe with enough force to bleed. And as for you, Sakaki. Naruto spat as he slowly turned towards the crimson bandit and with a slight motion pressed the wrist blade tighter into the man's throat, drawing thin rivulets of blood, which caused Sakaki to immediately drop his dagger. If you have anything to say in your defense before I pass judgment, you'd best state your case now, before you lose your head and your voice along with it. M my case. Sakaki was at a loss for words. Yes, your case. Surely you have some reason for attacking these women that you can defend yourself with. Something about the way he smiled when he said it suggested that Naruto had absolutely no doubts as to whether these accusations against Sakaki were false. I, I. Sakaki stammered with fright. Naruto retracted his blade, the thin dagger sliding harmlessly back into the sheath strapped to his wrist. Sakaki had been watching that hand so intently that he never saw the right hook coming, until it slammed into his lower jaw with devastating results. The soon-to-be ex-lieutenant of Zaraki Kenpachi tumbled backwards, landing on his butt in a humiliating fashion. I see. Naruto nodded sagely, calmly walking to where Sakaki lay groaning.
You're completely useless after all, aren't you? A petty man filled only with worthless lust and ambition, with no moral code whatsoever. And no. Oh. Naruto replied, as he smiled pleasantly before rolling his shoulders in a carefree shrug, as he crouched down to Sakaki's level and revealed a small raising and swirling in the palm of his hand. Then what you're saying is Kuranai sensei must have imagined you trying to rape her. And when that didn't work out you went after Ayami-san and I guess she imagined her attack as well, hmm. Th that was. Wrong. Naruto interrupted a bit too cheerily and the Rasengan began grow in his hand, before he continued on. I suppose I should have given you the warning I gave Daisuke about pissing me off. It certainly proved its effectiveness with him. But then again, you don't have anyone you cherish now do you? Probably why you tried to commit rape in the first place, huh? With a keening wail, Sakaki was hauled to his feet. Now held by the throat, it was all the traitorous bandit could do just to breathe, let alone plead for clemency from his superior. And still, the raising and crept toward his face, its white hot chakra threatening to scorch the already charred skin clear from Sakaki's face altogether. M my lord please. Mercy. Mercy. But Sakaki could tell by the look in Naruto's eyes that they held no mercy for the man. Looking about he spotted his most loyal servant Mako, a man who had pledged to give his very life since birth in service to the Hitoshi family and more specifically to Sakaki himself. Seeing his master signal him, Mako's subtlety raised his crossbow towards Naruto's back. No one noticed this, as everyone's attention was focused solely upon Sakaki and Naruto save for one person. Ino Yamanaka. Seeing where the weapon was pointed Ino in a panic performed the Kawarimi no Jutsu and substituted herself in place of Naruto just as Mako fired the arrow. Unexpectedly, a confused Naruto suddenly found himself standing next to Hanata and the others all of them bearing a look of sheer horror on their faces. Turning quickly around Naruto stood in shock as he saw Ino standing where he had been, but she now sported an arrow protruding from her chest. She turned her head and cast a weak smile at Naruto before she fell to the ground in a heap. It was at that moment that all hell broke loose. Seize that man, Kenpachi ordered, as several crimson bandits pounced upon Mako and wrestled him to the ground. Meanwhile, Naruto, Hanata, and the others raced over to Ino in a panic. Kneeling down with tears welling in his eyes, Naruto cradled Ino's body against his and growled out both in anger and sadness. Ino-chan you little fool. Why did you have to go and do that? It would take more than just an arrow in the back to take me down. Hanata-chan, you and the others take Ino-chan into the medical tent at once. I will join you there shortly. Hanata nodded and she and Kuranai along with several other people including Ayami rushed off with Ino. Kakashi and Sasuke remained behind with interest to see what Naruto would do next. They didn't have to wait long as Mako was dragged before the blonde-haired Jinchuriki. Naruto shot an icy glare to Sakaki who was still being held in place and asked with malevolence ringing in his voice. Who is this man? His, his name is Mako, he's my servant and has pledged his life to protect me. Sakaki stammered with defiance. Then his is a wasted life to protect an insect like you and his life is now forfeit to, me. All women and children need to leave this area now. All the men are to stay and watch what happens when you hurt one of my precious people. After a moment all the women and children that had been present were now gone from the area. Naruto then gripped Mako by his neck and held him high in the air, as red chakra erupted from his hand and set the man ablaze. Mako would have screamed in agony except his vocal cords were the first thing to be burned away as he flailed about desperately trying to escape from Naruto's death grip. Alas, it was to no avail, as Mako soon stopped struggling and after a couple of minutes he was nothing more than a pile of ashes at Naruto's feet. The Crimson Bandit leader then turned his attention back to Sakaki who had soiled himself after seeing his servant killed so brutally. Naruto was about to administer the same justice to Sakaki when an arm gripped his stopping him and a voice called out to him. Naruto-sama, please do not defile your hands by dealing with such an insignificant scum as this man before you. I ask that you let me deal with this gutless pig, as I've had a long-standing issue with him for many years. Daisuke humbly asked. Naruto looked Daisuke directly in the eye for any sense that he would not be able to deal with this wretch held before him. Noting the determined look in Daisuke's eyes and the dedication in his voice, Naruto nodded his acceptance and replied. Very well Daisuke, tomorrow morning you shall enact the punishment for this worm. Until then take him to the prison pit and post a guard of your choosing to watch over this animal for the night. By your command Naruto-sama. 
As Naruto watched, Daisuke and a few other men dragged Sakaki away he took notice of Shunsui and asked. Report on the training. Casualties were minimal, all in all only five of the men were unable to endure the training. They were disposed of when they lost their minds and tried to kill their comrades. If I may be so bold, I believe that the remainder has far exceeded our expectations. I dare say that a handful of them are almost at lieutenant level strength including Daisuke and possibly Sakaki. Then it should be an excellent battle were treated to in the morning. Naruto then cast a quick glance over some of his men. A few of them had wild grins in place of the terrified looks of horror they'd worn prior to their training, while others wore more melancholy expressions. Some refused to even look Naruto in the eye, which was good. They'd all gone through the training, and realized just what they were up against. Now it just remained to be seen whether or not they would remain sane. But one was different. One caught his eye. One of the men wore a look, not of irritation or melancholies, but of, complacency. His emerald green eyes leveled with Naruto's cerulean colored eyes and refused to break away, as the others had done. That, and his hand had never once left the dull green hilt of his sword. Interesting. Naruto thought to himself. You there. Naruto raised a finger towards his fellow blonde. Tell me your name. Kira Azura, sir. There was an uncharacteristic bite in the man's words, something that intrigued Naruto even further. What could this man possibly have against him, what could he have done, to make this one hate him so? Indeed, the hate was tangible. Then he saw the reason, the reason for Azura's burning stare. There, standing behind Kira, as if to hide, barely even noticeable amongst the hulking bandits, was a girl. She was a tiny little thing, her hair bound back into a bun, her skin fair and soft, suggesting she had yet to see the field of battle. She stole a glance up at Naruto, then hastily looked away, and for good reason. Her hand tightly gripped Kira's wrist, as if she was sole factor preventing him from lashing out at Naruto for his actions. Shunsui, Naruto began slowly, exchanging a glance with the former Gote 13 captain, who, as if he were actually aware of his superior's burning glare, turned his attention towards the couple. Who is this girl? I don't remember her being with the main group when you set out. In fact, she appears to be entirely out of place here altogether. She's a, young blonde man began, but Shunsui raised a hand toward the youth. Kira please, I am at fault for this. Allow me to explain myself. Please. Naruto waved a hand impatiently and added. I haven't got all day. Her name is Hinamori Momo. Shunsui relented. We, we, picked her up during our travels. Ah, well then, that explains quite a bit, doesn't it? Naruto stated with sarcasm, before adding. Never mind, you can explain her presence to me later. I'm needed elsewhere at the moment. Naruto then shushened away followed by Kakashi and Sasuke. This left both Shunsui and Kenpachi to silently wonder just what had happened to Naruto while they were away. Kiba held the message in his trembling hands as he read it. Delivered by messenger Falcon shortly after Hannah's departure, these handwritten words were sharper than any blade and had struck at the very core of his being with terrifying force. Now, there was no doubting Hannah's words, the order was perfectly clear and now official. Attention all Kanoa Shinobi. By order of Lady Sunad, the kill order for Uzumaki Naruto has hereby been rescinded, and reduced to a capture order. He is to be brought back alive at any and all costs, preferably unharmed if at all possible. Under no circumstances is he to be killed. Disobeying this order will be tantamount to treason. Sunad Senju, the god I'm Hokage. Defiant, Kiba crumpled the paper into his hand and tore it to shreds before Sakura could catch sight of it, uncaring of the questioning looks he received in turn. What did it say? Nothing. Kiba replied, lying through his teeth and hoping that Sakura would buy into it, as a show of frustration. Just that Akamaru won't be coming back and that they can't afford to supply us with any more tracking dogs, that's all. Oh oh. Her face fell at his words and for just a moment, Kiba swore he saw a thin smile stretch across the face of Sakura who then asked. Well, then what should we do now that we can't track Naruto? Go after that bastard. What else? And how do you plan on finding him? Sakura said with irritation and disgust of the Inzuka's behavior and seemed to have sided with Tazuna and Inari on this matter, for her expression suggested nothing less than outright disbelief before she added. We can't track him without a Kamaru. Hey. Kiba surprised everyone by straightening out of his crouch and smirking proudly, as he boasted. I may only be human, but an Inazuka's nose is just as good as a Kamaru's. 
Who do you think trained him all these years? Sakura sweat dropped and silently thought to herself. Why does that not reassure me? That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.